Okay, uh, so this talk is called Iteration Revisited. Uh, it's a talk I've given uh, at a couple of conferences. Uh, this, some of those videos aren't online yet, so this is, uh, I guess, for a, a lot of people, the first opportunity uh, you're going to get to see uh, see this talk. Um, it's really it's a talk in two parts. So the first part is kind of uh, motivation and background and uh, sort of what are some of the problems with the the iteration scheme that we have at the moment and uh, you know how, how we can how we can improve on that and the second half of the talk is about a library that i've been working on for the last year or so that's kind of implementing these ideas um so that's what's that's what's on the menu and uh as i say hopefully hopefully people will find it interesting so uh, as klaus said if you do have questions please pop them in the chat and um because of the way the streams work there's a bit of a delay so uh if you pop them in the chat and then at a couple of points uh, along the way uh, i'll stop and uh, and, and uh, check in with the questions and uh, and hopefully come up with some answers <laughs> okay so let's get started. So Iteration Revisited. Iteration Revisited is our topic uh, for this evening. So let's start by revisiting probably the first bit of iteration uh, many of us ever did uh, in C++ or, or in C or indeed uh, many other languages um, whose iteration schemes look like this. Okay, so this is, I think I may have used an int, but it's pretty much the first loop I ever wrote in, in C. We're just going to take an integer i, size t in this case. We're going to iterate while i is less than size. We're going to, uh, the size of some array, we're going to bump our index uh, at each iteration. And then we're going to access the ith element of some array and uh, do something with that, pass it to some function in this case. So if you're anything like me, you've written this hundreds, perhaps thousands of times. Um, but if you are, depending on, you know, your, your programming background, you may have choose to write this loop a little differently. Perhaps if you come from a C background and you're uh, very used to or very comfortable dealing with pointers, uh, you might choose to write the loop like this instead. You might. So in this case, we've got our uh, integer P, uh, sorry, our pointer P, which is initialized to the address of the start of the array. And we're going to continue iterating while P is not equal to the address of the start of the array offset by size elements. We're going to bump the pointer at each iteration. And then we're going to dereference the pointer to access the elements stored at that uh, memory address. So as I say, if you're from a C background, maybe you write something like this. Um, in C++ today, you probably wouldn't write this. You might write something more like this. So this is standard begin, uh, standard end. This is pretty handy because for an array of known bound, we don't have to keep the size variable around. Standard end is going to do, do the right thing. Um, but actually, you probably wouldn't even write this. You'd probably do something more like this. And OK, maybe you go one step further and you actually write a range for loop. Uh, but a range for loop is just syntactic sugar for pretty much what's on the screen now. So this transition from here to here, I really like this because it really emphasizes something about STL iterators, the standard iterators that we, we know that we've had uh, for for many decades. And that is that STL iterators are a generalization of array pointers. OK, we begin STL iterators, uh, begin with array pointers, pointers into C arrays, which are, they are, are iterators. They are the most, uh, the most powerful kind of iterators. And then they generalize from there. This is the, the Stepanov model that we've had for, for decades. And there are a number of advantages to this approach. It served us very well, obviously, you know. There are advantages to this approach. First of all, this is an extremely powerful model. We can go all the way up to random access to contiguous iterators. We can write, you know, any kind of algorithm you can think of writing. We can do sorts and all sorts of things with this model. It's very low overhead. We can literally just use a, a raw pointer as an iterator. You can't get much more 
much lower overhead than that. And this was particularly important back in the days when uh, compiler optimizers weren't nearly as good uh, or as sophisticated as they are today. This was uh, very important, you know, that this was very optimizable code, but it continues to be important today. If you try, if you have like uh, a lot of code using iterators and you, you look at it in Compiler Explorer, you'll very often see that all of that iterator stuff just disappears and you're left with, uh, you know, the, the kind of raw loop. So the iterators are, in many cases, a low overhead abstraction. This one is, is perhaps a bit more arguable, but iterators, STL iterators, they have a, a natural syntax in the sense that they use the same syntax as built-in pointers. So if you want to uh, be a C++ expert, you have, to, uh, you have to understand how pointers work and you have to understand the pointer syntax. And if you know that, then you know how iterators work. So there's a sort of natural uh, natural syntax there. I know there are a lot of people who don't like the iterator syntax, but uh, it is at least consistent with the language. So there are a number of advantages to our current iteration scheme, but there's one pretty big disadvantage as well, at least as I see it. And that is that because iterators are based on pointers and because pointers are a kind of iterator, Iterators are just as dangerous as raw pointers. That is, they are just as unsafe as raw pointers. Okay, so as soon as I start using words like dangerous and unsafe and talking about safety generally, we need to have a bit of an aside and ask, what do I mean by safety? So this is uh, becoming a... a or has become in re in the last year or so, perhaps a bit longer, a, a really big topic um, in the C++ world. There are lots of conference talks recently about safety. Um, it, you know, it's something we we have to we have to really start taking very seriously in our in our community. And. Different people have different opinions on precisely what what safety means for them. Uh, so, uh, for the purposes of this talk, what do I mean by safety? Well, I'm going to take uh, my definition of safety um, from a talk by Dave Abrahams. So, uh, Dave is a very well-known name in the C++ world. Uh, he was one of the co-founders of Boost many years ago. Then he went to uh, work on the Swift Standard Library at Apple. And now he's back working on a language called Val that's actually not called Val anymore. They've just changed the name to Hilo. Um, but working on a language now called Hilo uh, at Adobe, uh, the name used to be a, a memory safe uh, language based on um, mutable value semantics. Very interesting project. But anyway, uh, Dave gave this, this talk at CppCon last year, uh, and he used this definition of safety that I, that I really like, which is that a safe operation cannot cause undefined behavior. So that might be a little bit small on the screen, so let me just blow that up a tiny bit. A safe operation cannot cause undefined behavior. And I like this because undefined behavior is kind of the key. If we have undefined behavior, then any other kind of safety we might think about just doesn't matter. Because as soon as undefined behavior occurs, we can no longer reason about the state of our programs. Okay? Whatever other kinds of safety you might be worried about, it, it, it's immaterial in the face of undefined behavior. If we have UB in our programs, all bets are off. You know, we've, we've heard these, we've probably seen examples, uh, people like to do them in lightning talks often, of absolutely crazy things happening uh, when undefined behavior occurs. You know, functions being called that, that absolutely just don't appear in the thing and um, uh, optimizers just completely skipping large chunks of code because they assume that undefined behavior can't happen up here and so that they, this bit of code just disappears. Crazy things can happen with undefined behavior. If we have undefined behavior in our programs, we can no longer reason about the state of those programs, about the state of our programs. All bets are off. Undefined behavior is bad. So 
Here's our statement. A safe operation cannot cause undefined behavior. So let's go and have a look at a couple of examples of code using STL iterators and try and decide whether, uh, whether these things are safe given our definition of safety. So I think perhaps people might have a, a slight inkling as to where this, where this is going, but let's have, a, let's have a look at some examples. Okay, so first example. What we're doing here is we're initializing an iterator to the past the end position of some range. Let's assume it's a vector. And this is perfectly fine. We can have a past the end iterator. Uh, that's, that's a perfectly valid thing to do. What we can't do is what's happening on line two, which is dereferencing the past the end iterator. So if you just think about it as, a, as an array, we're allowed to form a pointer to one, one past the end of an array, but we're not allowed to, there is no object there, so we're not allowed to try and access the object at that position, okay? Attempting to do so is undefined behavior. Hmm. Okay, so that's not great. So what about if we have our past the end iterator and rather than attempting to dereference it, we attempt to increment our past the end iterator. Well, unfortunately, this isn't very good either. Again, we can form a pointer to one past one position past the end of an array in C++. That's the language allows us to do that, but we can't go any further. We can't just start forming a pointer to arbitrary uh, memory addresses. Incrementing a past the end iterator is undefined behavior. And so is decrementing a begin iterator. If we have, uh, if we have a bidirectional range, we get a, an iterator to the first position and we decrement that iterator, operator minus minus, that's undefined behavior. The same thing happens if we have a random access iterator and we do random access jumps that happen to land outside of the, uh, of the range, it's undefined behavior. Okay, slightly more complicated example this time, well, very slightly more complicated. Okay, so what we've got here is uh, a function called min iter, and what this does is it takes a vector, const reference to a vector, and it returns an iterator which points to the minimum element in this vector. Okay, the least element. So I guess somebody didn't like uh, the fact that you have to type vec.begin and vec.end, so they just made a vector wrapper for a uh, standard min element because right, they, they haven't heard of ranges either, but okay. So Minita is, is fine, it works okay, except there's a slight problem here. Because what happens if we uh, have a function get vector that returns by value? Imagine it returns some vector of integers by value. Okay, well, we can uh, bind the, uh, we can uh, pass the result of, uh, of calling get vector into uh, the minito function call. We can bind the uh, const reference, the vec, to our temporary. That's all going to work fine. Uh, min element is going to, it's going to run, it's going to find the iterator to the minimum position, it's going to return that from the function, and it's going to store that iterator uh, in the iter variable. All of this is fine. The problem occurs at just the little closing semicolon. And what happens there, the end of the statement, or the, technically it's the full expression, but the, the end of the statement, the temporary vector gets destroyed. And at that point, iter is a dangling iterator. Okay, again, we can think of it as a, uh, as a pointer. It's an abstraction around a pointer. In the case of vector, it's literally a wrap around a pointer. Iter is pointing to some deleted memory. So on the next, on the last line, when we attempt to dereference that iterator, that is, you guessed it, undefined behavior. And dangling iterators can occur depressingly easily. Okay. And pretty much any operation we attempt to do uh, with with a dangling iterator is going to be UB. We can delete. We can you know allow it to 
be destroyed or we can reinitialize it with assignment, but pretty much any other operation we try and do on a dangling iterator, uh, it's, going to, it's going to be UB. So, um, so this isn't great. Okay, the last example now. And this is, uh, this, this, is, this is an example that really, that really hurts me. This is, I, I really hate, <laughs> I really hate this example. Um, and so uh, at this point, uh, usually if I'm giving this talk in person, I, I go and I ask, I ask the, would ask the audience, you know, what is, what is the problem here? What is, uh, you know, what is going wrong? And because I, you know, often at C++ conference, there's a room full of C++ experts and they will go, oh, well, it's iterator invalidation, obviously. And then I ask them, well, how do you know that? And they're like, um, well, because I've been, you know, because I've got experience, because, uh, you know, because I've seen this, I've seen this problem and I've stored it in my mind that this is something that can occur and it has to be avoided, right? This is particularly insidious. So let's just go through and, uh, and see what's happening uh, for those who maybe haven't seen this before. Uh, so we're going to initialize our iterator to point to uh, the, the start of some vector. And you can think of it as, well, literally what it is, is iter is storing a pointer to the start of the vector's internal storage. That's what's going on. Then we're going to push back. We're going to add an element to the end of the vector. And if the vector is at capacity, if the vector is at capacity, then this is going to cause an internal reallocation and the vector is going to allocate a new array, move everything from the old array into the new array, delete the old array. And at that point, our iter that we've saved up at the top is now uh, a dangling iterator. It's now pointing to a pointer to some deleted memory. And so checking the, uh, whether we are now, our saved data is now equal to the end of the newly allocated array, that's undefined behavior. We're not allowed to compare two arbitrary, uh, arbitrary pointers like that. So this is, this is particularly insidious because, first of all, if you're not uh, an experienced C++ programmer, it is absolutely not obvious that there is anything wrong with this particular bit of code. Right? You have to know that pushback potentially invalidates iterators. And secondly, if, it, if you write this, the chances are this is going to work fine most of the time. This could, you know, this could very well be sitting in your code base for 20 years. And then all of a sudden, your standard library just changes its vector growth pattern. Or somebody changes, you know, a line of code in a completely different function, and suddenly VEC is slightly, you know, has one more element than it did before at the start of the function, and now the pushback causes a reallocation when it didn't before, and all of a sudden we've now got undefined behavior when we this code worked perfectly well. This 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 upsets me. This 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 example. So iterators can become dangling in non-obvious ways. This, to me, it's certainly not obvious uh, that this is that this is problematic code. You know, uh, unless you, unless somebody has told you, or you've you know really studied your C++ textbooks. So this is all part of the C++ experience, right? It's just something you have to learn. So our statement was. A safe operation cannot cause undefined behavior. And yet, most iterator operations can potentially cause UB, as we've just seen. So if we put these two statements together, then there's kind of only one conclusion we can draw, right? Which is that, unfortunately, STL iterators are a fundamentally unsafe abstraction, according to our definition of safety. Okay, I can uh, see 
One comment popped up in the chat. I wonder if there are, uh, sorry, one question in the chat. I wonder if there are any other uh, questions at this point, just. Uh... All right, so indeed, we have a question about slide 12. So um, let me just read the question. Wouldn't the iterator be dangling after min -iter, min iter returns because the lifetime of the temporary would finish by then? Um, let me just go back to slide 12. Uh, so the, the temporary lasts uh, on the, the line that begins auto iter, the temporary lasts until, uh, uh, until the end of the statement effectively. That's All right. just the rules of the language. All right. Next line, uh, it, it could also be the end iterator again. Now the same thing that you had in the slide before, because min element, if it doesn't find anything, which is for the empty range, of course, uh, would also return oh, well, the end iterator. Yes. Yes. This. Uh, so you be again. Okay. Thank you. If we That's are okay. if we are guaranteed that get vector returns a non-empty iterator, yeah, sure. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Okay. Where were we? Okay. So safety is important. Safety, safety is important. Safety is a big deal. And if one of our most fundamental abstractions is, you know, is not great from a safety point of view, let's put it kindly. Um, what can we do about it? Can we come up with uh, another, a perhaps uh, slightly different iteration model um, that, that addresses some of these problems? Well, if we're going to do that, we first of all probably have to decide, uh, you know, what, what do we need an iteration model to do? You know, what are the requirements uh, of an iteration scheme? And it turns out uh, and this is not new, you know, this has been well known in the literature for, for decades, but it, uh, an external iteration scheme, we need to provide four operations. We need, we need to be able to do perform four operations. Okay, so we've got, our, going back to our, our iteration code that we saw earlier, our for loop using iterators here, we need to be able to do four things. First of all, we need to be able to initialize some iteration state. We need some variable that keeps track of our iteration state. So with uh, STL iterators, this is the iterator that holds our iteration state. Okay. So we need to initialize. We need to be able to check whether iteration is complete. So again, with iterators, we do this by comparing with the, uh, the pass the end iterator or Sentinel in C++20. We need to have some way, some end check operation. We need some way to read the sequence element corresponding to our safe state. You know, if we can't do that, then it's not a very useful iteration scheme. So we need a read operation, and in uh, with iterators, that's the the dereference operation, right? And finally, we need some way of advancing our iteration state, so that we're now moving on to look at the next element in our sequence. Okay, so again, this is, this is not kind of new uh, information. This has been known for a very long time. In fact, if you think about the design of the for loop in the C language, it's designed around these four operations, right? So, but, uh, but I, I mean, you know, until recently, I hadn't really thought about, uh, about it in terms, in, the, in these terms. So four operations, initialize, check, read, advance. And then we do check, read, advance, check, read, advance uh, in a loop until such time as the check tells us that iteration is complete. So these four operations are fundamental. But what's interesting is that we don't actually need to provide them as four separate functions. So in particular, some people might be familiar with the uh, the Rust iteration scheme. And the way that works is that uh, there is just one function uh, called next that returns uh, uh, an optional in C++ terms. And this performs the check, read, and advance uh, operations in one, in one function call. Okay, it fuses these operations together. So there are 
Advantages to this approach. So I wrote a whole library, uh, you know, investigating this. There are advantages to this approach. The, the chief advantage being that uh, it, it's very much simpler. You know, producers, consumers, there's only really one function you need to worry about, which is the next function. It's much simpler than the C++ approach. Unfortunately, uh, there, are, there are drawbacks as well in that we lose some expressivity. There are algorithms that we cannot implement with Rust iterators that we can with C++ iterators. There are algorithms that we can't implement as efficiently as we can with C++, where these are four separate operations. So if we want uh, full generality, if we want or to be able to, uh, a new iteration scheme that can do all of the things that C++ iterators can do, we have to provide these four operations as individual functions. Uh, but there are other iteration schemes that fuse these together, uh, have slightly different designs. Uh, and um, if you're anything like me and you find this quite, quite an interesting topic, I really, really highly recommend uh, this talk from Barry Reslin. Um, it was a CP, keynote to CPP Paris a, a couple of years ago. So uh, look this up on YouTube. This is a really, really fantastic, interesting talk. He compares the C++ iteration model to D, to Rust, to Python, to Java, C Sharp, a whole load of things. It's a really fantastic talk. Okay. So we know what our iteration scheme needs to do. We need to Initialize, check, read, and advance. Is there perhaps a way of doing iteration that we are already familiar with that performs these four operations and that does so in a way that is safer than with iterators? Well, I reckon there is, and I reckon every single person watching this stream is already familiar with it. In fact, I know that you're already familiar with it because it was the very first slide of this presentation. So, and that is iteration by indices. So we've got uh, this example here. We're now iterating over a vector. And we're going to iterate by index this time. Okay, so what are our four fundamental operations? now. Well, first of all, we're initializing our iteration state. Our iteration state now is just an index i, some index into uh, our vector. Our end check is whether our index is less than the size of the vector. That is, it's uh, not at the terminal position. And now, Crucially, our read operation, we are defining our read operation to be a bounds check read. Okay, we're going to call vec.at. That is the definition of our read operation for the new, uh, our new iteration scheme. And finally, our advance operation is just uh, incrementing the index. Okay, so with our new definitions, our new uh, definitions of our iteration operations, what, what happens if we take the, the iterator examples, the problematic examples we looked at earlier with iterators where we were causing undefined behavior, what happens if we substitute in our new operations instead? Well, let's have a look. We're going to have a look at the same examples, but substituting in our newly defined iteration operations instead. So here was our first example. Uh, previously, we were, had an iter that was uh, initialized to standard end. The equivalent with indices it would be to initialize an index to the end position, which is uh, the size of the vector. And then we're going to do our re perform our read operation. This was the dereference operation for iterators. Uh, and this time, we're performing our read operation, which is defined to be calling vec.at. So in this case, reading via a past the end index is bounds checked. So what this is going to do is going to th uh, uh, throw an exception. So this is 
well-defined, not undefined behavior. Now, maybe you don't like exceptions in your code base and that's fine. The point is not about exceptions. The point is that by doing a bounds checked read, we, have, we don't get undefined behavior. We can still reason about the state of our program. What about the next, uh, the next example? So in this case, we had our pass the end iterator previously, now our pass the end index. And previously we were incrementing that iterator and getting undefined behavior. Now what happens is we have our pass the end index and we increment that. Well, our index is just a size T and the increment operation is well-defined for all values of size T you know, if you, you can't do it, but even if you theoretically could have a, a vector that was a size T max uh, in size, uh, size T, you know, plus plus is just going to wrap around to zero because it's, a, it's an unsigned value and that's well defined. Um, and that's not even a problem because you can't actually make a vector that size. But uh, so incrementing a past the end index is fine. Um, assuming we, you know, either use unsigned indices or we have some uh, checked uh, operation on signed if we if we use signed indices this is absolutely fine so this was our third example the one we, we've looked at uh, we looked at twice in fact so previously we had the function min iter now we've got a function min index that returns the index of the least element in some vector it's only a, a couple of lines uh, of code to implement but the implementation is not particularly important um, but uh, what's important is the interface, right? So we're now going to call min index and we're going to pass in a temporary standard, uh, a temporary vector of ints just as we did before. And now min index is going to work and it's going to return the index, the iteration state corresponding to uh, the iteration state corresponding to the lowest, the least position in the vector. And then what? And then that's it, right? Our temporary vector is destroyed and we can't have undefined behavior because we can't even perform a read because our read operation requires having the vector or the sequence more generally in order to actually, you know, try even try to do a read. So if we're dealing with the temporary, you know, we can't even we can't even attempt to do <laughs> we can't even attempt to do a, a read because we simply don't have the vector around anymore. So dangling indices, dangling indices. Yes, we can get a dangling index, but all we're doing is we're left holding on to a size t in our in this particular case. Dangling indices are safe by design because we can't do anything with them. Okay, finally, let's have a look at this, this example that, I, that I, I really hated, this example that really upset me. Um, the iterator invalidation caused by pushback. So what happens if we use indices now instead? So rather than initializing iter to vec.begin, we're now going to initialize our index to the start of uh, the initial position for the vector, which is just zero. So this is our initialization operation. Then we're going to call push back on the vector. And then we're going to, uh, and, you know, imagine this causes a reallocation inside the vector. And then we're going to compare our index to the new size of the vector. And it just works. Right? Our, our index hasn't been invalidated cannot be invalidated uh, by the pushback into the vector. Uh, index invalidation problems are no longer undefined behavior. Now, we can have, we, not in this particular case, because pushback can only grow the vector, but uh, you know, more generally, perhaps we can have index invalidation if we're holding on to index number 100 and we've resized the vector so it's only got 50 elements. Then, yes, our next, our next read operation It's going to uh, is going to, to to error. It's going to be a, a bounds check. But the point is, we defined our read operation such that 
This is not undefined behavior. Index-based iteration compared with pointer-based iteration dramatically reduces the potential for UB. And yet it's just as powerful. That is, all of the algorithms that we would be able to write with iterators, we can write with indices instead. We can go all the way up to random access. You know, of course we can. We do random access with indices all the time. Right? In fact, if you go and grab your nearest algorithms textbook, they probably show you the algorithm in terms of indices, and then you have to go back and translate that in terms of doing it with, with iterators. So if index-based iteration is safer and still just as powerful, what if, what if perhaps we were to rather than doing what the STL did, which is to take the, uh, the notion of, of, of iteration by pointer and generalize from there. We take the notion of iteration by index and generalize that instead. So that is uh, the idea behind uh, a library that I've been working on uh, as I say, for around about the last year or so, on and off, uh, which is a, a library called Flux. So that really, that was kind of the first, the first half, roughly, of the of the talk. A little bit more, uh, and the second half of this of the talk is focusing on the library that I've written, Flux. That's kind of uh, investigating the, these ideas, but perhaps this is a a good. Uh, a good place to pause and just uh, see if any more questions have have come in uh, in the last oh, few yes, minutes. Yes, absolutely. So there are a couple more questions. Uh, let me just read them in order. Uh, this probably makes um, uh, the most sense. So I myself ask a question uh, because I'm, I'm just super curious. You said that uh, some algorithms cannot be efficiently by, cannot be implemented efficiently efficiently in in friends by this Rust iterator scheme. Do you have a couple of examples for that? I'm just curious. Uh, yeah, well, yeah, so the, the obvious example is sort. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, so Rust iterators, uh, they, they um, are not random access. And they're, they sort of have bidirectional iterators, but they're not quite the same as C++ bidirectional iterators. Um, so, uh, in the C++ scheme, you can go backwards from where you are now, which uh, is not kind of not quite the way uh, Rust iterators work. Um, but I mean, the, the classic example would be would be a sort algorithm. Um, it, it, yeah. yeah. So there are definitely advantages to it. It's it's a lot simpler than than the C++ approach, but it's uh, mm -hmm. you lose some expressivity, as I say. Yeah, totally, totally uh, understand. Okay, then uh, there's another question which probably many, many people in the, in the audience has had, have had. <laughs> so slide 19. On slide 19, you uh, said that we should switch to indices. But can you give examples of how to trade by index over map or set? I kind of expect this is what you're not talking about in the next part. Um, I, I don't have a, a specific example uh, of this. So um, this is something that is, uh, it's not difficult to do with the, the um, the, the flux scheme, right? Because uh, we can iterate over, well, let, let's consider like a linked list, which is node-based containers in general. We'll consider a linked list because that's the simplest example. Uh, what we we want to do is we have our, our iteration state um, encapsulated in what we're going to see on, on the very next slide, we encapsulate this in an object called a cursor. So for, uh, it's like a generalization of an index. So for a node-based container, our, our iteration state is uh, generally, it's like a pointer to a node, right? So this is a bit sad because it means that we, we still have to worry about lifetimes, but it's just kind of the natural way uh, of implementing um, uh, uh, iteration over a, over a, a node-based container. The problem is, and this is a bit problematic, is how do we, uh, how do we provide, can we provide any safety guarantees uh, when we're dealing with uh, raw pointers. And there you, yes, uh, sort of, but there are trade-offs involved. 
right? Because mm. we're dealing with, with fundamentally, we're dealing with a language that doesn't provide any safety guarantees. So we have to work quite hard uh, when we're dealing with uh, raw raw memory uh, to do that. So. If I've got a bit of time, or maybe if we're going to join the uh, the chat afterwards, I'll I'll go into you know a few different approaches to that. Um, it is possible, but we need uh, it, it's uh, it involves some trade offs. All right, and I'm already uh, interested in the after talk chat. Okay, <laughs> next question, um, which is probably also kind of an obvious one about performance. So you said that we should use the add function for vector in order to make sure that we never have undefined behavior. But how much is performance affected by this explicit bounds check? Um, we're going to have a okay. few slides on that uh, towards the end. So I'll get to that. Uh, I'll get to that in a little while. OK, thank you. Don't very worry. Much. I know this is C++. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. This is why I kind of uh, anticipated and then people have this question. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's let's continue. OK. Thank you. All right. So uh, Flux, Flux is a uh, library I've been working on. It's basically exploring exploring these ideas. It, I mean, it literally started off as um, just just me having this idea of well, what if we instead of generalizing from pointers, what if we generalize from indices instead? And I, you know, I tried it out and found that actually it works and it works really well. And then I sort of polished it up and gave it a name. And uh, so there we are. Uh, if I flick back to the right window, there we are. So um, it's a C++ 20 library. And uh, it aims, first of all, uh, to provide much improved safety uh, by default. That's all the things we were talking about uh, in the first part of the talk. Aims to provide much improved safety by default compared to using iterators. Um, as you'll know, if as people might know, if they've seen any of my, any of my talks before, uh, I'm a big fan of, uh, of ranges. I've used ranges a lot I've, for, for many years now. And I'm sort of aware of, you know, some of the, maybe some of the rougher edges, some of the things that aren't, uh, aren't ideal about the way ranges are implemented. So with Flux, there's kind of an opportunity for me to uh, do some of the things perhaps in a slightly nicer way. Um, so offer, offer improved ease of use as well. Um, I'd like Flux to offer a uh, runtime that is at least as good uh, as C++20 ranges, uh, and in some cases, as we'll see, uh, quite a lot better as well. So um, this is something we're, we're going to talk about uh, towards the end. Uh, and finally, uh, I, want, I want Flux to offer compatibility with existing STL code. You know, the, the standard library, the iterator model, the algorithms have been around since the, the mid '90s. Um, any sort of meaningfully large C++ program is going to be using, probably going to be using, uh, iterators and algorithms, um, or certainly a, a very large number of C++ programs. We can't just pretend this stuff doesn't exist. I can't just sit here and say, "Well, forget about all that and start using this new thing instead." There has to be some sort of compatibility story. Uh, so we'll talk about uh, the compatibility as well. OK, so what are our, our iteration operations uh, in the Flux library? So um, we saw uh, previously what our, our four uh, important operations are. So how do we, how do we spell those in, in Flux? What are, what are the functions we need to call? So our initialization operation uh, in Flux is a function called first. So first takes a sequence and returns you an object called a cursor. So a cursor, we can think of it as a generalization of an index. So I didn't want to reuse the term index because uh, I feel that's very strongly associated uh, with, with like an integer uh, index that you might use for an array or a vector. And in Flux, uh, a cursor is more general than that. It doesn't have to be uh, an index. So in the same way that an iterator is a generalization of an array pointer, uh, a cursor is a generalization of an integer index. Uh, but it just so happens that for uh, contiguous sequences, uh, it is, a cursor is literally an integer index. So over the following slides, if you see the term cursor, if you just sort of mentally substitute index, then you'll, you'll have the right idea. So that's our initialization operation. Our end check in flux 
uh, is this function is last. So we take our sequence and we ask it, is this cursor position index, if you want to think of it that way, is this a pass the end cursor? Our read operation is simply called read at. So we ask a sequence, please will you give me the element uh, at this cursor position? And finally, our advance operation uh, in Flux is spelt ink. So we're incrementing the cursor. So this takes the cursor by reference and it uh, asks the sequence, okay, please will you uh, increment this cursor so that it now points to the next uh, the next element. So these are our operations. And what you'll notice is that the, the end check, the read operation and the advance operation in this model, they all take the sequence as their first argument. Okay. In the flux model, the cursor just represents a sequence position and nothing else. Okay. In the, with the traditional STL iterators, STL iterators are smart, right? They know how to dereference themselves. They know how to uh, advance themselves. And this is one of the things that makes the iterator model so complicated. Whereas in the flux model, cursor is a position in a sequence and nothing else. And we have to ask the sequence itself, is this a past the end cursor? Please, will you give me the element corresponding? to this cursor. Please really increment this cursor. So this tremendously simplifies uh, implementing cursors and actually implementing this the uh, sequence uh, API as we're going to see in a couple of slides time. But it also means that we avoid these problems with dangling. The, we saw an example of this earlier, but it means that if we no longer have our sequence, if it's gone out of scope, um, but we're somehow we're still holding on to the cursor, that's that's perfectly fine because we can't actually call any of the sequence operations uh, without the sequence present. Uh, sorry, any of our iteration operations without the sequence present. Okay, so I've used the term uh, sequence a lot. Sequence is a concept uh, in the in the Flux library uh, and a type which provides those uh, provides those four operations, we say it models the sequence concept. So I didn't want to reuse the term range because that would be very confusing. Uh, so in Flux, these things are called sequences. Um, and like in ranges, we assume that sequences are single pass by default. That is, once we've traversed through, uh, then these elements have you know, disappeared and we can never get them again. Uh, but like ranges, uh, ranges have a category of forward, forward ranges. And the equivalent category in Flux, we call them multi-pass sequences. So a multi-pass sequence is one which allows you to have multiple cursors at the same time, and those cursors can iterate through independently. Now, the cursors can only move in one direction. They can only uh, go forward, but you can have multiple cursors uh, independently. And once you've got to the end, you can call first on your sequence again, and it will uh, begin iterating at the beginning again. So multi-pass sequences uh, have a few more requirements on them than uh, single-pass sequences. In particular, the cursor type for a multi-pass sequence needs to be what we call a regular type. Uh, so regular type is one that is default constructible, copyable, and equality comparable. So these are just needed uh, operations that we need in order to write algorithms, useful algorithms uh, on multi-pass sequences. So equality comparable, we need to be able to say, do these cursors re uh, represent the same position uh, in a sequence? So a multi-pass sequence requires its cursor type to be regular. And uh, conversely, if your sequence, uh, if your cursor, if your sequence's cursor type is regular, then we assume your cursor, we assume, sorry, that your sequence uh, is multi-pass. Right. So um, if you're familiar with this stuff uh, in, in C++, with C++ ranges uh, and iterators, you have to kind of opt in. You have to use this iterator tag to uh, tell, it, tell the machinery whether you are an input iterator or whether you're a forward iterator. Um, in Flux, if 
your cursor is a regular type. We assume that you're a multi-pass sequence. Uh, and that actually covers pretty much all the cases because uh, cursors for single-pass sequences usually or pretty much always should be uh, move only. Right? That's just kind of what, what makes sense uh, semantically. So uh, certainly for all the default types provided in the library, uh, single-pass cursors are move only. Uh, so this, there is an opt-out, but generally you don't need it. So we have single pass sequences, multi pass sequences. We can go even further. We can have bi directional sequences. These are multi pass sequences that additionally allow a cursor to be decremented. So the counterpart to flux inc is flux dec, and this moves a cursor back one place. And finally, we have random access sequences, or not quite finally, but we have random access sequences provide additional operations. So we have, oops, we have uh, an overload of ink that takes a signed offset that can do uh, a jump uh, in places or offset places uh, in constant time. We have a function called distance that given two cursors tells us uh, the, uh, how many elements there are in between those two cursor positions. And finally, cursors for random access sequences are required to be totally ordered. That is, if we've got two cursors, we need to be able to say, okay, is this position earlier or later in the sequence than this position? Oh, there are also uh, contiguous sequences. These are the equivalent of contiguous ranges. They allow us to do uh, low-level optimizations, things like mem copy um, uh, on, uh, on, on contiguous uh, sort of uh, memory-backed uh, sequences. We've got uh, bounded sequences. So if people are familiar with C++20 ranges, uh, the equivalent concept here is something called common range. So we have our end check is, is last. Um, this is very useful because not all sequences are able to provide you with uh, a past-the-end cursor. Uh, easily, so uh, in particular single pass sequences. So uh, we our end check is spelt is last, but sometimes it is useful to get the past the end cursor position. And so if a sequence is able to do that, it's called a bounded sequence. And if we have a bounded sequence, we can call this function last again the counterpart to first, and it returns us uh, the past the end uh, the past the end cursor. We, just as we have size ranges, we have sized sequences. So if a sequence knows ahead of time how many elements it contains, it's called size sequence. And we can call this function flux size that tells us how many elements that sequence have has. And finally, we have infinite sequences, uh, which provide a compile time guarantee that uh, is last, always returns false. And so, um, you know, we, we're just gonna, it's just going to keep on, keep on giving us uh, elements forever and ever and ever. So with these concepts, with these functions, uh, as you can see, if you're familiar with the C++ uh, uh, ranges, these are direct analogs of those range categories. And we have direct analogs for our uh, iterator operations. Uh, these map very cleanly onto the operations in Flux. So you can actually take uh, a huge or pretty much any algorithm which uses uh, iterators and it's almost like a mechanical conversion right to rewrite it as a flux algorithm it's really it's really quite easy it's not very difficult to do take you know it takes you a bit of time substituting all the things but it works well and so using these uh, these algorithms and these uh, sorry using these concepts and these functions uh, we can write a whole lot of uh, a whole lot of, of sequence algorithms. So there are an awful lot of them in the STL and we don't have uh, equivalents for all of them in Flux yet. Hopefully we will one day. Uh, but as of, uh, as of today, as of August uh, 23, uh, these are the ones we have, uh, algorithms we have implemented in, in Flux so far. And so, you know, quite a few already, quite a few useful ones. <laughs>
But C plus plus twenty. Um, C++ 20 brings us a whole load of new functionality. So all the algorithms, all of the things, the equivalents, STL equivalents of what you see on the screen, we've had those for a very long time, since 1998, even a bit further, pre-standard C++. But C++ 20 brings us a whole load of new functionality in the shape of the ranges library, all these things with views. And what they allow us to do uh, is to build up pipelines of operations. So this is, uh, as, a, as I say, if you've seen any of my talks before, you know that this is something that I, that I, I really like, uh, I'm a big fan of, and so obviously I want to be able to do that uh, in Flux as well. And so you can. And so like C++20 ranges, Flux provides a variety of sequence adapters which perform lazy operations in the same way that the uh, ranges views do. And just as with ranges, we typically compose these into pipelines. So a pipeline begins with some data source. And then we plug in zero or more adapters into our pipeline. And then finally, we end with, some, with a call to some algorithm that is going to iterate through our adapted sequence. So this algorithm, it might be uh, one of the Flux named algorithms that we've just seen. It might be a custom written algorithm. It might be an STL algorithm, as we'll see. Um, or it might be a for loop, right? Because a for loop is just an algorithm that you haven't given a name to yet. So let's have a little uh, look at the, the syntax of using a Flux pipeline. Uh, so we're going to start off with uh, some, some vector of integers, vec. And then what we want to do is we want to calculate the maximum of the squares of the even numbers uh, in this vector. So this is the kind of uh, example code that you all often see with, um, uh, with, with ranges, just because it's easy to understand and it fits on the slide. So the first thing we need to do in Flux is we need to decide how we're going to iterate over our source. Do we want to iterate over a copy of the vector or do we want to move the vector? Vector, or as in this case, do we want to iterate over a reference uh, to the vector? So in this case, uh, I've chosen, I said that I want to iterate over a reference to vec. Then I'm going to apply a filter adapter. So the way this is done in Flux is with the dot syntax. Okay, so this is immediately a bit of a change from C++ 20 ranges. In Flux, we use the dot syntax. So, uh, C++20 would use the pipe operator. We'd say pipe, standard views, filter, and then pass our predicates. Um, Flux chooses to, or the, 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 the design I, I've chosen is to use the, uh, to use member functions instead, to use the dot syntax instead. There, are, there really aren't any technical reasons for this. There's not, you know, it's not, doesn't make more efficient code or anything like that. What it does is it makes, in my opinion at least, makes our code much more readable. I, you know, I, I find that it is much easier to read examples if everything's just something dot filter, you know, dot map, dot this, dot that. A chain of operations, at least to me, it becomes much more readable than pipe standard filter, pipe standard views filter, pipe standard views transform, blah, 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 like that. That's one advantage. The other advantage is uh, just from a, a, a user friendliness point of view is that IDEs, when you press the dot key, are very good at popping up a big long list of all the operations that you can apply at that point. And they'll even give you like the function signature or, and maybe a sentence or two of, from the, the documentation. Whereas if you just type vec and then the the, the uh, pipe character, you know, you get no help from your IDE, uh, no help from your IDE whatsoever. So um, this is, uh, as I say, it's not really a technical thing. It's more of a user friendliness or readability uh, perspective. Uh, we choose to use the, the dot syntax uh, in Flux. So uh, going back to the example, we've got our filter adapter, and then we're going to push this, uh, push the 
result of that through the map adapter. So this is the operation that's called standard views transform in the standard library, but literally every other uh, library and language <laughs> of, the, of this kind calls this operation map. So uh, C++ ranges calling it transform is really, really an outlier. Uh, so we call the operation map uh, in Flux as well, because uh, it's such a fundamental one, one that you use so frequently. So we filter map uh, are our adapters, and then we're going to call an algorithm, and the algorithm we're going to, we're going to call is max. So max uh, does exactly what you think. It returns the maximum value uh, in the sequence. Um, but there's actually a bug in this code. Uh, so normally I would ask people to try and spot the bug. The bug is not the missing semicolon. There's another bug in this code. And that is that what happen, and that, that, that we have to ask what happens if the vector is empty, or perhaps what happens if the vector only contains odd numbers. Because in that case, what we'll be trying to do is to find the maximum of nothing, the maximum of an empty sequence. Um, and like, what do we do in that situation? Well, if you ask the standard library, standard range is max. If you pass it an empty range, um, that's undefined behavior. So we don't want that in Flux. So what we do, our max operation actually returns you an optional. So we have to, uh, as the user, choose what we want to do. If the source sequence is empty, we get an empty optional. Otherwise, we get an optional containing uh, the minimum element. So for this particular example, I've decided that uh, if the source vector is empty, uh, we're just going to store zero. Um, so this is using a lot of built-in operations. Um, one of the questions might be, well, what happens if you have, you know, how do you use this with custom adapters, with custom algorithms? Uh, so Flux supports that. So we could, if we wanted to, choose to write it like this instead. So we have this dot and then underscore, function called underscore, dot underscore. And then what we can do is we can pass a custom adapter um, and then the arguments to that adapter uh, into this function. And in fact, if we wanted to, we could write our whole pipeline like that because uh, Flux provides uh, free function versions of all of, the, uh, of all the, the adapters and algorithms as well. So we could write it like this, uh, and this is how we would use uh, you know, custom adapters, uh, custom algorithms uh, as well. So Flux provides uh, a whole load of uh, sequence adapters. Uh, there is a, this is um, almost all of the ones that are in C plus plus twenty three. There's one. Uh, there's one missing because I um, I forgot about it, uh, but it will be there. Um, but uh, we've got all the ones uh, in C plus plus twenty three. All of the ones, as far as I know, that are currently proposed for C plus plus twenty six, uh, and a few more besides. So uh, we've got an awful lot, uh, an awful lot of adapters, and uh, we'll be getting more all the time because uh, they're very very useful. Okay, time is time is getting on, um, and I'm I'm already uh, over <laughs> a bit over the uh, where I was where I was supposed to be. So uh, apologies that if if I'm delaying people's uh, dinner plans or anything like that. Um, so I'll go over this this next part uh, uh, quite quickly. This is just uh, what I wanted to show was uh, how we would implement. The sequence protocol. We've seen how we can use sequences, how we can build up a pipeline. What does it look like from the other end, from a, from the producer side? Okay, how do we uh, how do we implement uh, the sequence protocol in Flux? So what I've got here is uh, let me start again. I've got some array type. Uh, just called it my array. So this is kind of the, the equivalent of standard array that already has an implementation, a sequence implementation built into Flux. So what we've got, what we've got is uh, you know some sort of custom array type called my array. So in order to implement the sequence protocol, what we do is we have to provide a specialization of a class template called Flux sequence traits. So we specialize this for uh, my array. So this is kind of a, a, a common pattern for uh, for providing uh, specializations, and so we're going to have this alias self t. It, this just saves a bit of typing. 
a bit of room on the slides. And now we need to provide the implementation of these four functions uh, that we saw a few slides ago. So we need to provide uh, an implementation of the first function. So this is a static member function uh, of this uh, customized of this um, this specialization. So in this case, we've decided that our cursor type is size t, and our first uh, function is just going to return zero. Going to initialize our size t to zero. So that's initializing our uh, our iteration. Our is last check. Well, it checks, is the cursor position you've given me, is that past the end of the array? And if it is, then iteration must be complete. Our increment operation, very simply, just increments the cursor. And finally, our read operation performs a bounds check. So we have a function called flux bounds check. This is basically an assert um, that also provides a, a nice mess, a nice error message. This is we're going to check that the cursor is less than the size of uh, the array. And if we do this, then we know that the following line, uh, if it executes, does not uh, cause undefined behavior. Okay, so the pre the the behavior in flux of what, what exactly happens if a bounds check fails, this is configurable. By default, it's going to call standard terminate. You can also configure the library so that it, it throws an exception instead uh, if you prefer to, uh, to use exceptions. And that is the complete implementation of the sequence uh, uh, protocol for the MyArray type. And what you'll notice is that, very importantly, with the, when we include the bounds check, all of these uh, uh, low-level operations are guaranteed not to cause undefined behavior. Okay, All of these operations are either safe on a size t or we're, bound, we're performing a bounds check. Because if we can have our low-level operations being safe, then we can build safe things on top of that. Whereas if our if our fundamental operations are unsafe, then every you know it's very difficult to build <laughs> build on a on an unstable foundation. Right? We need our lowest-level functions to be safe, and so we have to be careful to do that. Uh, and we can see that in this particular example, we have uh, implemented these functions safely. But that's it. This is all we have to do with these four functions. Uh, and that is a valid implementation. We can statically assert that my array is now a multipass sequence. OK, it's multipass because the cursor type, in this case a size t, is a regular type. So this is a valid multipass sequence. If we wanted to go to bidirectional, we'd have to add one more function. We'd have to add a deck implementation. If we wanted to go to random access, we'd have to add a couple more functions after that. This is, you know, this is about as simple as I could possibly make it. And if you've ever tried implementing uh, a C++, uh, you know, a fully conforming random access iterator, you'll know that there are just dozens and dozens and dozens of functions you have to do. That is something I really wanted to avoid in Flux. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, this is hopefully quite a lot simpler. So we can provide it. Uh, oh yes, and just as a as a shortcut, you can actually, uh, if you own the type, uh, if you are the author of the type my array, you can actually embed the flux sequence traits struct inside your type. So you don't have to do this external specialization. Uh, so this is uh, just kind of uh, a, a nice kind of time saver as well. Makes uh, makes your source code look a bit a bit tidier. So. Sequences are considerably easier to implement compared to STL ranges, even more so for higher range categories. And we avoid all of this confusion with iterators and const iterators. Um, if you've, again, as I say, if you've ever implemented these things, you'll know that this is a major headache. Uh, so uh, fortunately in, in Flux, because our iterators don't have any, sorry, our cursors don't have any operations defined on them, this is... Uh, this is very, very, uh, uh, just makes the, makes everything so much simpler.
I mentioned earlier that uh, one of the things I wanted to do in Flux is to provide compatibility with ranges. Uh, that is, with existing code that uses STL iterators and STL al and algorithms written uh, around STL iterators. Uh, so there are there are kinds of two sides to this. So first of all, if I have an existing you know uh, STL range or C plus plus twenty range. Can I use that as the source of some Flux pipeline? And conversely, if I have a Flux sequence, can I use that uh, with code um, that's based around iterators or C++ 20 ranges? And the answer is yes in both cases. So first of all, uh, every C++ 20 contiguous range is automatically a Flux contiguous sequence. We have uh, a blanket implementation for all every C++ everything that matches the C++ 20 contiguous range concept. It's automatically a Flux contiguous sequence. The reason we can do this is because contiguous ranges are cheaply indexable. We can get the data pointer. We can offset from the data pointer. We can do uh, cheap bounds checking. So this covers. Vector, array, string, string view, span, all of these things, uh, every contiguous sequence, it's every contiguous range. You can just use it with Flux. You don't have to do anything at all. For other kinds of ranges, uh, you have to wrap your range in the sequence uh, API in the way that we just saw. So for that, we have a function called from range uh, that takes uh, some range object. And in that case, because uh, our Flux operations first and is last, etc., are now we have to call the iterator operations, we're reducing the safety guarantees. So this is this is not ideal. This is a bit sad uh, that we can't provide the safety guarantees. But as I say, we have to call you know the un the potentially unsafe iterator code. Uh, so this is kind of it's there for compatibility. Um, but it uh, it unfortunately you know reduces some of the some of the promises that Flux tries to make. Uh, but it's no worse than using ranges directly, right? This just means that our it, uh, our iteration operations are calling uh, the the range iterator operations. So this is going in one direction. Conversely, every Flux sequence is is an STL range. Okay, every uh, Flux sequence provides STL compatible iterators. You can call begin and end on any Flux sequence and it will give you an, a C20 iterator. So this means that we can use Flux sequences if we build up some sort of pipeline and it gives us a sequence, we can use this with any C20 algorithm that uses, uses ranges or uses iterators. We could use it with C20 range adapters if we wanted to. And importantly, it means that we can use them with uh, built-in range for loops as well, which is uh, very useful. So uh, if you're curious about how this is done, we have, uh, there's just an implementation, a sequence iterator implementation. It looks like this. It holds a pointer to the sequence uh, and a cursor, and then all, defines all of the uh, iterator operations in terms of uh, the equivalent operations. Um, so your oh, iterator increment calls flux inc, uh, that sort of thing. So we to you know we implement all of the many, many <laughs> uh, iterator operations in terms of their flux equivalents. So it means that we can use any flux sequence um, uh, with our with our existing uh, range algorithms, which is really nice. Okay. I've already uh, taken up an awful lot of your time. There is one, one section left uh, that's quite important, and um, it's something that uh, Klaus already brought up. It's time to talk about this guy. Let's address the elephant in the room. The question that, uh, well, I know that popped into some people's heads, which is about performance. I talk about bounds checking um, and immediately alarm bells go off in people's heads and like, is this going to completely uh, like destroy the performance of all my algorithms? And the answer is no. <laughs> in most cases, well, in pretty much all cases, no. Because first of all, compilers are just incredibly good at eliding bounds checks, right? 
They're really, really, really good at it. Um, many, if most, perhaps every new language that you can think of for the, like, the past 20 or 30 years uses bounds checking pretty much everywhere, right? Rust, Swift, Go, all of these kinds of languages, they use bounds checking universally. And it means that optimizers are really, really good at recognizing these patterns. Right. And the other the other thing to, to note is that the way that the flux iteration scheme is done, we're very, very often we call is last and then immediately we call our read operation. And very often the bounds check and the is last check are the exact same thing. And the compiler can go, well, I've literally just checked this on the line of code above. And so I don't need to do it again. And so in many, many, many cases, uh, Compilers can just, you know, elide the bounds checks. Uh, so here's uh, a little example of that. Um, here's a, a function I've got called count evens. So what we do is this is just the, the imperative version of the code. We've just got a for loop and uh, we iterate over the vector. And if we have an even element, uh, then we, uh, we increment our counts. So this is the, uh, the version using a, a range based for loop, which will be using iterators behind the scenes. Um, one way of writing this in flux uh, would be to use the macro flux4. So what the flux4 uh, macro does, it's mostly just I use it for testing. Uh, it sort of performs iteration using these, uh, these flux primitives, the uh, you know, is last, uh, read at, and inc. So if we, um, if we compare these two, uh, we can see that fundamentally the, the algorithm is kind of the same shape. There's uh, the compilers decided to lay things out in, in slightly different registers, but you know, there aren't a huge number of differences between these two implementations. And in fact, if you try and benchmark these, you'll see that, uh, you know, it, it, the, the noise far outweighs any, uh, uh, any differences that might, there might be. I certainly wasn't able to, to measure any differences between these two implementations. So as I say, this this implementation was using Flux four, but this is this is really just an internal macro that I use for testing. Because if we, uh, you know, the the idiomatic use of the library, certainly the recommended use of the library, would be to use named algorithms instead, where such named algorithms exist. And in this case, what we are trying to do is count if, right? We want to count if we have an even element. So what happens? if we use the COUNTIF function uh, instead of this ugly flux for macro. Well, if we substitute in flux COUNTIF uh, instead, what you can see is now the compiler is generating precisely 100% bit for bit identical code for both implementations of this function. The only thing that's changed uh, in the diff is the function name. 100% identical code. So how does this magic work? Well, this is uh, down to something called internal iteration. So the flux sequence protocol has an extra optional customization point, which is called for each while. And what this does is you pass it a predicate and while the predicate, uh, while the predicate is true, we instruct the sequence to iterate over itself in the best way that it knows how, the most efficient way that this sequence knows how to iterate over its elements. Do that until and pass each element to the predicate so we can test it uh, until the predicate returns false. And it turns out that many sequence adapters things like filter and map and a whole load of others, it turns out that they can actually perform internal iteration more efficiently than by doing a, a check read advance through a loop. If you think about how you do these in a pipeline, you know, if we call, we have a pipeline of, you know, five adapters, we call check on this one, which calls check on that, on that one, on that one, on that one. Internal iteration lets us kind of rewrite the loop inside out. So, Internal iteration, many sequence adapters can do it more efficiently. 
And it turns out many algorithms can be rewritten to use internal iteration. So if you put these two things together, it's really great because in many cases, Flux pipelines can actually generate more efficient code by using internal iteration, more efficient code than the equivalent C++ 20 ranges pipelines. So we're going to uh, see a little example of that uh, on this slide. So here I've got uh, some ranges code. Uh, we're going to do a similar th thing to what we saw earlier. We're going to take uh, a vector. We're going to filter it to keep the even numbers. We're going to square each element, and then we're going to sum up uh, all of those uh, all of those numbers. So this is a ranges pipeline to do that. Uh, Here's the equivalent flux code. So we're going to iterate over a reference to the vector, do the filter, do the map, and then we just have an algorithm called sum. And let's compare now these two implementations. So this time the flux code is on the left and the ranges code is on the right. And you can see that this time we've generated completely different looking code in both cases. And in fact, the flux code on the left, there's, there's an awful lot more assembly generated. There, there's, you know, the, much, much smaller uh, assembly um, on the right. But if you look very carefully, you'll see that on the left, we've got a lot of these um, uh, vectorized uh, instructions. We're using SIMD operations for the flux code. The compiler has been able to see through all of our operations and actually vectorize the code, uh, which it couldn't do uh, with, the ranges, with the ranges implementation. So we're going to get faster code uh, on the left than on the right, or we're very likely to. So if we are in the happy case and we can use internal iteration, then typically we don't need to do any internal bounds checking. The sequence is in charge of, of iteration. We know that nobody else is going to be messing with our cursors, so we don't need to do internal bounds checking. And in many other cases, the compiler can optimize away bounds checks. Compilers are very, very good at that. What about corner cases? Um, well, for corner cases, if you have benchmarked and you have profiled and you have seen that you know this bounds check actually is causing me problems, well, then there is an alternative version of readat. It's called readat unchecked. And what this does is it performs uh, the same as readat but uh, avoids the bounds check. So this is like an unsafe operation. It potentially uh, gives you undefined behavior, uh, but it avoids the bounds check. Uh, and the idea is that this can be used selectively only where you have measured and profiled and you know that you need it. Then you can use this readat unchecked function. And you can think of this as being the equivalent of unsafe blocks uh, in other languages. Um, so uh, I've I've gone on and on and on uh, much longer than I than I intended to. Um, so I hope uh, <laughs> I, I hope that uh, people don't don't mind too much. Uh, but that's the end. So a concluding slide that uh, Flux C plus plus twenty library for what's it's called a sequence orientated program and collection orientated program. This idea of building up pipelines of operations. It can be used anywhere that C plus plus twenty ranges can be used offers improved safety, an easy to use API for both producers and consumers, as we've looked at. It offers compatibility with existing STL code, and in many cases, uh, better performance, uh, or performance that is at least as good, and in many cases better uh, than equivalent C++ 20 ranges pipelines. Um, so that's it from me. Um, I don't know, perhaps we, we might have one or two questions maybe um, before we, we move on to Zoom. I'll leave, that, uh, I'll leave that to Klaus. All right, then first of all, thank you very much for the talk. I was uh, pretty fascinated, so the entire time. Uh, and one of my first questions is answered. You um, have given a flex um, link to the GitHub uh, repo, thank you. We actually have a quite a number of questions, and I, I, I hope that people don't mind that uh, this, of course, might take a few more minutes, but um, I think they're pretty good questions. So, uh, CPAL, CPPAL asks, can existing iterators uh, semantics be made safe at a performance cost by having containers always return only proxy objects as iterators, which internally checked with internally checked operations? 
Um, yes, so in fact, the uh, Microsoft STL has um, uh, debug iterators uh, that um, do actually store an awful lot more information uh, in the iterator. Uh, mm. this, these are a, a kind of infamous, I think, uh, with a lot of people because uh, <laughs> they have pretty disastrous performance. Um, mm. uh, and so uh, a lot of people disable them. Um, so it is possible, but it, it gives you a much bigger performance hit than, uh, at least in my experience, uh, than then the, the flux uh, approach of keeping your uh, requiring the sequence to be around right so the problem is you try and uh, and and keep all the data in the iterator itself this ends up being uh, very tricky to do mm -hmm. so with the flux approach of having a cursor just represents a sequence position and nothing else and we uh, keep the sequence separately and you you know you provide the sequence to all of your iteration operations um, this uh, this tends to be uh, tends tends to avoid the performance problems of, of STL debug iterators. Okay, thank you. Uh, <laughs> and actually, two questions in in one um, post. So, are infinite sequences backed by some coroutine yield mechanics? First question. Um, okay, so kind of two questions. So. Uh, Infinite sequences, no, they're not. Um, they don't have to use coroutines. In fact, we do have there's something called a flux generator, which you can use coroutines, um, but that's I don't think that's related to the question, uh, but just by the by. Um, infinite sequences are, are nothing to do with coroutines. What it is is basically it means the author of a sequence has said this is an infinite sequence. So we saw an implementation of you know how we implement uh, the flux uh, sequence uh, interface. So basically, you just have a, a, a const extra bool, static const extra bool uh, member variable in that sequence trait specialization that says, mm -hmm. I am an infinite sequence. And in that case, uh, we can, in some cases, have slightly different code paths uh, within, the, uh, within the library. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's, that's how it's done. Okay, perfect. Um, then Stefan asks, What's flux take on mismatching cursors and containers? So um, if you get a cursor of sequence one and then you do read that with uh, at sequence two. Okay, so um, flux's take is that this should not give you undefined behavior. So, um, I mean, we can just think about it in terms of, so, so first of all, you know, a lot of the time the type safety is going to uh, going to prevent us from from doing this in the first place, right? You're not going to be able to take, uh, like, um, if some some adapt some sequence adapter probably will change the the cursor type so that you can't uh, you just you're going to get a compile error if you try and uh, pass it to read at with a mismatched sequence type. But if you have two uh, let's say you have two vectors and they are using the same cursor type. Um, mm -hmm. What happens if you, because for a vector, the cursor type is literally just uh, just an int or an integer type. What happens if you if you mix and match? Well, you're going to read the wrong the wrong element. Um, that's that's pretty much what's going to happen. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, so exactly as you would with with indices. Um, so if one if you know if if you try and use index number 1000 and your vector's only got 10 elements, well, you know, you're going to get a bounds check failure. That's a bug in yep. your program, but uh, it's not going to be uh, undefined behavior. That's that's you, take. You mentioned that sometimes for the node-based containers, you have to take a slightly different approach, still using some kind of pointer. Is it still true? <laughs> Um, yeah, so it's a node node based um, node based things are, are really tricky if you want to try and avoid yeah. this uh, the the uh, if you want to try and provide safety guarantees mm -hmm. um, because uh, <laughs> this might be this might be a bit of a long answer but basically you have to do something like for example uh, using kind of shared pointers to make sure that things mm -hmm. don't get invalidated whilst you're holding onto a cursor or you have to do something like allocating out of an arena that you control so that you mm -hmm. can uh, check to make sure that nobody um, you know nobody else is is deleting things out of your arena uh, or you can do things uh, you can put add sort of generation counts to your uh, to your sequence type and to mm -hmm. your 
your cursor type. And what this allows you to do is to, uh, every time you, you modify the container in some way, you uh, increment its internal generation, generation counts. And then if the uh, generation count doesn't match the one that you've saved in the cursor, uh, then you, you, you uh, consider that an error at that point and you, mm -hmm. you raise some sort of runtime error. Uh, so the, the, third the third is the, uh, the least invasive uh, but it, it means that you lose uh, the what, the equivalent of like the iterator yeah. stability, which is kind of one of the reasons that people like using standard list. In fact, it's pretty much the only reason anybody ever uses standard list, I yeah. think. Um, so you kind of lose that property. But on the other hand, you've got index sta stable indices for vectors. So, you know, what you lose in the one hand, you, you gain on the other. Yeah, that's true. Okay. Okay, last question um, for me. Uh, it was uh, I, I've never heard about internal iteration before. So, where can I find more information about that topic? Um, I don't know of any uh, references or uh, talks specifically about this. So, the the talk by Barry uh, Resin uh, that I mentioned, um, mm -hmm. he uh, towards uh, the last sort of uh, 15, 20 minutes of that talk, he talks about internal iteration. So that's um, that's a, a really good reference. I don't know uh, any particular um, off the top of my head sort of uh, books or, or other conference talks other than the, the one by Barry. Um, but uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it is it's definitely a, a very useful technique. Yeah, which, which is a good enough reference. Okay, <laughs> then thank you very much again. This was a pleasure for us. Um, so now to everybody who's watching, you are now free to join us in the Zoom after talk chat. I just posted a link a couple of minutes ago. Um, all you have to do is to use the link to go to Zoom, and then you do have the opportunity to ask uh, questions to Tristan personally. All right. So, Tristan, thanks again. And I see you. Thank a you very of much. In the Zoom <laughs> chat. Thank you.